Penn State football gets another commitment here on Monday, and this time it's not for the class of 2023, but the Nittany Lions getting it done through the transfer portal. Offensive lineman Hunter Norzad from Cornell chooses the Nittany Lions over Iowa. A big win in a Big Ten battle in recruiting. Offensive line coach Phil Troutwine has been on fire recently. I'm your host of the BWI Daily Edition, Thomas Frank Carr. Recorded earlier today with Greg Pickle. We'll be getting to your wrestling update that we're doing here on Mondays in just a little bit. But this breaking news, we want to make sure you're informed and we stay up to date as possible here on the Daily Edition. So Hunter Norzad choosing the Nittany Lions this afternoon, and it is the fifth commitment to Penn State along the offensive line that Phil Troutwine has gotten since January 28th. And that spans the transfer portal all the way to the class of 2024. Uh, with Norzad being the latest in the transfer portal, also getting a late flip in Vega Ioane in the class of 2022, getting two in 23, and then, of course, uh, Cooper Cousins all the way in the class of 2024. So Penn State doing a lot of lifting. Phil Troutwine on fire on the offensive line. And it's not just for upcoming classes as well. Check this out. Dramatically overhauling the interior, especially of the offensive line. We'll get to that in just a second. Penn State bringing in three freshmen in the class of 2022. These are players that are going to be here this summer with eligibility. Juco, one, you're getting the J.B. Nelson from Lackawanna Community College. And, of course, Norzad, the latest through the transfer portal. So every means necessary, Penn State is bringing in offensive linemen, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're done just yet. We'll keep you up to date on more of the stuff in the transfer portal. But Hunter Norzad uh, playing tackle at Cornell will shift to the interior and play guard. And when I say that they're reshifting and recalibrating the interior of the offensive line, uh, uh, head coach James Franklin during Ioane's uh, com uh, commitment announcement during National Signing Day said that he could contribute early in his career, possibly. Whatever that means as far as timing and whether, whether it means as a freshman later in the season, on special teams, however that might factor in, that is... Rare for James Franklin to say that about an interior player, somebody on the offensive line in particular. And then, of course, J.B. Nelson, a Juco transfer, more old, an older, more mature player, and Norzad, all interior players. So Penn State has depth and flexibility and competition on the interior, which they did not have a season ago, and we saw the results of that. So a, a very important win for Penn State in the transfer portal. And uh, going a little bit into what Norzad brings to the table, Based on his film, I think there's going to be some comparisons to Eric Wilson, 6'4", 305, 300 pounds coming in from uh, from Harvard a year ago, 6'4", 300, about where we have uh, Hunter Norris at, at the moment, but different in terms of how they play. Wilson, much more of a technician, one with quickness, one with getting his hips in the right spot and blocking with technical ability. Norzad is more of a brawler. He's physical. He throws his body at defenders, so a more uh, tenacious run blocker, I'd say. And then as a pass protector, kicking inside, so he's got that tackle versatility in a similar vein to what Eric Wilson had. So uh, pass protection should not be an issue for him, at least from an athleticism standpoint, as he goes to the interior. Whether he's going to start, whether he's going to be a part of the competition remains to be seen, but he did choose Penn State over Iowa. And I think a, an important battle there uh, of similar philosophies. Iowa obviously runs a lot of zone systems. Penn State did not run as much outside zone last year, and I think part of that was they didn't have the players to execute that on both the interior and the exterior of their offensive line. But with a player like Norzad, tenacity, physicality, and the athleticism, I think that you can get some of those more those reach blocks, reach blocks we've talked about recently, some of the ability to get some of those more advanced, more athletic blocks is a possibility. Nothing's guaranteed at this point, but Penn State is active and aggressive in the portal and getting Hunter Norzat. Uh, last thing is more players could be coming in in the class. We'll keep you updated on that. One player that we've been talking about that Penn State has targeted, Tyler Steen out of Vanderbilt. He played tackle, so Penn State's still light on tackle players specifically coming into this class. But with Steen, the update there is that Virginia has recruited his brother, in the class of 2022. So trying to lure him to campus with family members on the roster, that may play a factor in this going forward, but Penn State getting a win with Hunter Norzad and whether they get Tyler Steen or not, we'll keep you up to date on that. So that's your breaking news. Penn State getting a commit in the class of 2022 in the transfer portal. So Penn State the dramatically reshifting 
and recalibrating what they've had on the offensive line after a disappointing season last year. Getting to Greg Pickle and wrestling next. BWI Daily Edition on Monday means Greg Pickle joining us to talk about Penn State wrestling and over the last couple of weeks, Penn State recruiting as they've been on a hot streak. We'll get to that today on the Daily Edition. Greg, welcome to the show. How was your weekend? Well, you know, again, it's always a weird one when you have this law of no football. I know the Senior Bowl was on. I caught a couple of glimpses of that. The Pro Bowl was on. I didn't catch any glimpses of that, nor do I, uh, <laughs> and nor am I disappointed that I didn't catch any of that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, at this point, it's weird. We're waiting to the Super Bowl, that uh, pending doom, I think is one way to put it, of knowing football is almost gone from our lives, at least the game part of it, uh, for a, quite a bit of time. So, yeah, other than that, all good, T. Frank. Uh, ready to keep charging on through another week of February here as Penn State uh, gets going with winter workouts and all the good stuff that bridges the gap between now and the start of a new season. Yeah, luckily, I, I don't have any shortage of football film to watch with Penn State football's recruiting efforts over the last couple of weeks. But right. with, the, with, the, with the Pro Bowl, I'm glad that the players are having fun with it and you had Stephon Diggs covering Javon Diggs in flipping roles in the Pro Bowl, but, like, nobody cares. Nobody right. cares about the Pro Bowl, and it's the impending doom of the void of no football, one of my least yeah. favorite weekends in football. But we're going to start with uh we're going to start with wrestling because Penn State wins their uh latest dual title for the regular season and of course the BJC duel was on Friday night a spectacle in wrestling not just Penn State wrestling so take us through Penn State's victory there and how they overcame a couple of things because it sounds like there's more flux in the lineup isn't that right that's 100% correct, T. Frank. Yeah, I mean, anyone that's been watching us here the last few Mondays or reading anything either over at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com or in the magazine has noted that there's not been very many weekends where Penn State's been at 100% full strength. I mean, there's been more lately, but you remember the 2021 portion of this schedule. That was a tough issue for Penn State to deal with. It did not stop them from being unbeaten, of course, and it did not stop them on this particular uh, weekend when they beat Ohio State and then Nebraska to win the regular season dual uh, Big Ten title. So uh, a lot of good efforts from Penn State on Friday night. It was pretty much a domination from start to finish, even without Brady Berge at 165 pounds, even without Carter Starachi at 174 pounds. You know, I'm thinking both of those guys could be back for next weekend when they wrestle Ryder, but it's more likely than not. I think that they'll wait out uh, until the Big Ten tournament starts. So we'll see how that shakes out. Penn State, again, though, not really uh, – taken aback by not having those guys in the lineup and ultimately they put a lot of good performances on paper really made the home fans happy and it led to an enormous uh 32 7 victory team wise for the Nittany Lions so you you've mentioned this a couple of times when it comes to Penn State wrestling especially this year Kale Sanderson's teams are always it seems clutch but a lot of really close victories this weekend especially uh on that night against Ohio State so uh, who and who kind of came through for the Nittany Lions to get that victory to make the number at the end seem big and like it was a decisive victory, but how it got there felt a little bit closer than that, right? Yeah, so two Nittany Lions, Terrell Bearcock and Creighton Etzel, uh, won in such victory at 157 pounds and 165 pounds for the Nittany Lions, and that really separated the team race. I mean, don't get me wrong, Penn State was pretty much dominating outside of a loss at 149 anyway. But if Ohio State, T. Frank, was going to have any chance of winning this match, which on paper, even with the guys out of Penn State's lineup, they had minimal chance of winning this match. But they were going to have to win at 157, 165, and 174, and they only earned a victory at 174. Now, they did uh, nearly, uh, Scavin Hoffman did nearly beat Max Dean, who won in overtime and sudden victory at 197. But, yeah, ultimately... Uh, you know, Ohio State knew where it could take advantage of Penn State's lineup. It knew how it was going to have to go about doing that, and it just didn't. And with credit to Penn State and the wrestlers, Terrell Bearclaw, who we know is close and maybe has locked up that 157-pound spot, time will tell. And then with Creighton Edsel, a guy who uh, was replaced by Brady Berge and had to kind of wait for his chance to get back on the match at Matt, and he did, and he took advantage of it. So that was good to see as well. 
We'll recap uh, the weekend with Greg Pickle going forward. And, of course, in tournament time, we'll give you Penn State wrestling information uh, when we get there. But if you want it in real time, you want to talk to Greg about this stuff on the message board as well, subscribe to On3 for just $1. It is the first link in the video uh, in the description of this video. So just scroll down, hit that, and you'll go get the recaps from Greg, the previews, the notebooks, uh, what Cale Sanderson has to say, which is coming up later this week. So make sure you subscribe to Blue White Illustrated for just $1, and you'll get all of this information in real time as it goes up on the website. Uh, but I love talking wrestling and recapping it with you here because we get to get a little deeper on some things like uh, maybe another BJC duel. You hinted at that. You talked a little bit about that, how there's maybe not moving over there full time, but there's an opportunity right. to do a little bit more at the BJC. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I think Kale Sanderson's pushed for that now a couple of times, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Again, there's some really good competitive advantages Penn State gets from being at the rec hall venue that, of course, it's been at for so long, and it's a difficult place for opposing teams to come and wrestle, but it's also difficult for opposing teams to wrestle Penn State wrestling anywhere. So, um, <laughs> could I be out in a field, it would be hard. It's exactly right. Yeah, if they were wrestling in the mud pits that sometimes the grass parking lots turn into for football games, uh, it would still be a challenge. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, again, the biggest question is you get 15,600, whatever it ultimately ended up being. You know, the question just is, are you getting that number because it's a one-off rare event or because you could get that every time? I'm not sure you could get it every time. I right. think you could probably get close. And But I do think that, you know, rec hall is rec hall. It means a lot to a lot of people. So I don't expect Penn State to uh, be in any sort of rush, I guess you could say, to move a whole bunch of matches to the Bryce Jordan Center. But certainly I think there's room to at least move one more over there, make it two, maybe even three. Uh, and I think that would do things well. And, and it becomes an event when it goes over there. And it, some of the right. things you touched on is just things you can't do at Rec Hall that you can create an environment at the BJC because it's a place that hosts concerts and 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 uh, large just large events. It has more ability to do those things. Uh, and I guess then the question becomes, does that reduce the feeling of it time and time again if you do it more often? And it seems like the answer is there's more room for this to grow, correct? Yes. Yeah, I think so. hundred percent. You know, I, to, to me, uh, you know, again, the, the idea I think Kale Sanderson has is wanting to grow the sport, grow wrestling. Right. And I right, think, right. and I think we all know that Penn state fans have a huge, uh, affinity, I guess you could say for wrestling, but there's also the reality of it too, T Frank, that it's not the easiest sport for some people to understand. It's not, you know, yeah. it's not readily apparent what a takedown might be or what a reversal might be or how many points this or that is. So yeah. the more people you get in person to see this, I think, gives you the opportunity to educate more people on that. So I think there's, there's more of this going on around the country. We're seeing more and more college wrestling teams wrestle in bigger venues because let's be honest – the 6,600 to go to uh, Rec Hall for a wrestling match, most of them all, I would be willing to bet 99.8% of them, uh, are longtime wrestling fans, probably yep. season ticket holders of some sort. You know, they get the sport, and that's good. Penn State is one of the most knowledgeable home crowds in the country, but uh, the more people you add to that, the more interest you gather and the more, and the more you know, opportunities you have to create excitement within the fan base for things besides football. So. Absolutely. I think there's room to grow. Yeah. And that's I've had this conversation with a couple of people of how do you grow a sport? How do you grow interest? And, you know, mm -hmm. for what it is, you know, wrestling, even though there isn't really a, a major league for players and wrestlers to go on to. I know the MMA and I know there's, you know, obviously sure. WWE and things like that that aren't exactly a collegiate Olympic wrestling thing. Then you have the Olympics every four years. But it is it is made for TV as far as it, it's all in the center stage. It's all right there. It's just, you know, how do you grow the sport? How do you get more interest in it? And having a dominant program like Penn State, having a, you know, a, a titan that is willing to put themselves out there and do this more often makes sense. And speaking of that, another close victory to secure the Big Ten title on Sunday. Take us through the Nebraska duel and what happened there. Yeah, so again, you're without uh, you're without Brady Berge at 165. You're without Carter Starachi at 174, and then uh, Max Dean was did not wrestle at 197. He had, excuse me, been the starter there. Michael Beard, who was of course an All American at that weight class previously, wrestled for Penn State. I didn't think he received the fair shake from the officials in a 6-4 loss to Colton Schultz. 
He was obviously a very good wrestler. But yeah, you know, Penn State again uh, gets bonus points at 120, or I'm sorry, at 133. Rome Revo Young wins by technical fall. Uh, they get bonus points at 184 as well. Aaron Brooks wins by a major decision. And otherwise, it was just good technical wrestling for Penn State. You know, Drew Hildebrand kicks things off with another victory. Creighton Etzel wins uh, seven or nine to two, rather, and really put the pressure on uh, his opponent from start to finish. Like what I saw from him, obviously, I think Brady Berge is his spot to lose. But we you know remember why Penn State felt good about Creighton Etzel. I know he maybe didn't perform as well as some hoped earlier in the season, but you know, again, Nebraska has it fourteen ten after uh, Mikey Labriola beats Mason Anvil at one seventy four, and then Penn State. Uh, you know, gets bonus points from Brooks to not completely seal the duel because that happened a little bit later when Greg Kirkfleet beat Christian Lance in the final match of the day. But really put it, Penn State in a pretty good place, even though it was wrestling without one of its hammers at 197. So, you know, another good just team win. And again, it's not always been easy, but uh, Penn State comes through when it counts. They always have, and they always seem like they will. And this particular uh team that we've talked about before seems to have a little bit extra of that magic but to the to the question of the players and and the wrestlers that were not there do you have any insight as to what the situation is illness injury and when you might see them back you mentioned a couple you you think might be back for next weekend's uh duel against Ryder correct yeah, I think that it's possible that we could see Max Dean back or Brady Verge back. I'm not sure we're going to see Carter Starachi back until the Big Tens. And frankly, I don't know if we'll see either one of those other two guys either because, you know, again, uh, Penn State's not going to need those guys to beat Ryder. I try not to be rude to Ryder, but that's just the reality of the situation. Penn State has so many advantages that I don't think they'll have an issue with or without those guys. So they will only see them back for this final duel meet of the regular season, T. Frank, if they are a hundred percent and b not at risk of aggravating or re-aggravating or making worse whatever it is wrong with them at this point. So we'll get into more of uh, what's coming up for Penn State wrestling after or as we preview, preview the Ryder Duel coming up next week. So make sure you tune in Mondays. We talk about wrestling here on the BWI Daily Edition with our wrestling reporter, Greg Pickle. But uh, Greg covers a bunch of different things, including Penn State recruiting. And it was a big weekend. Penn State got another commitment in the class of 2023 in Jevin Williams. Take us through what you know about Williams and uh, this run that Penn State is going through along the offensive line. Yeah, it was interesting, T. Frank, because I think we all kind of figured Jevin Williams would end up at Penn State, but i got to be honest with you, when James Franklin's bat alert, signal alert, whatever you want to call it, his We Are Better tweet went out, uh, if you would have been able to freeze time in that second and you would have given me five guesses about who just committed, I'm just not sure <laughs> Jevin Williams would have been the pick. I didn't get the sense he was that close to deciding. He had just not too long ago put out a list of top schools, so... I really thought like it might be a little bit before he made his final decision, but for whatever reason, after the January contact period, he decided that this was the right decision for him. And, you know, he had offers from all over the place. I can't think of his top group uh, off the top of my head at this second in time, but I know that there were a lot of big name programs in yeah. the mix for him. Pitt Michigan Pitt. I believe yeah. Michigan State was another one. Uh, a lot of, yep. yeah, Kentucky was another one. And again, Kentucky has been getting into these conversations with Notre Dame and Penn State offensive line recruits with their ability to develop players at that particular position. So another strong get for Penn State as they've battled back and forth with a couple of those programs. Yeah, you know, I think the most interesting thing is just how much they're investing in the offensive line. Yeah. And it comes on the heels of December where we were kind of getting the impression that maybe Penn State would be doing a little bit less work when it comes to recruiting high school offensive linemen. And now it's actually turned the complete opposite way. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, they're taking as many as they can. I think it's a reality, T. Frank, that it sounds great to try and get guys in the transfer portal. It is much harder to do than what it sounds like. You know, it's much yeah. it, it's harder said than done, I guess is what, uh, or it's easier said than done, I guess, is how I want to phrase that here on a Monday morning. But yeah, I mean, I think that's just the reality of it. Everyone wants to fix their program through the transfer portal, but everyone can't because there's yep. not enough guys in it to be able to do that. So, yep. You know, I like the idea of pushing for guys. Of course, they're going to keep doing it. And some years it's going to work and some years it's not. But I just think that what you're seeing here is Penn State kind of acknowledging that even though they prefer to do it one way, it's not simple. It's not really that simple to be able to do it that way consistently. Yeah, and just in general, get volume at the offensive line because 
it creates depth, it creates competition, and just like every other position, uh, you you're gonna miss on some guys, and some guys that you aren't expecting are gonna hit and turn into great players. So if you have great players and then you go into the portal and enrich a strength, that's different than having dire needs and addressing them through the portal. Right. Don't wait around, I guess is what I'm saying. And that's what Penn State has done when it comes to recruiting. They still have the opportunity to add five, maybe even six players in this class of 2023. But Jevin Williams, 6'4", 300 pounds, great reach, uh, working on his T. Frank's film room as we uh, are talking today. Uh, Impressive athlete. I think they're getting a lot of versatility on the offensive line. And uh, I I think Penn State fans should be hopeful that all of these are going to return and the receipts are going to get here. You know, obviously as we've talked about in the past, it's just going to be a couple of years, right? That's the biggest problem. Yeah. Yeah. But you mentioned uh, the class of 2023 in general. Uh, uh, One quick question before we move on to something you wrote about earlier this week. Are is your opinion changing on offensive line, the recruiting and Phil Troutwine, as far as what we've seen from him so far with the way Mm. 22 ended and 23 has started? I mean, maybe a little bit, but again, the, I, I, it's going to sound like I'm not trying to. It's going to sound like I'm not giving Phil Troutwine credit, and I don't want it to come off that way. But at the same time, we need to see it on the field, T. Frank. Right? I mean, it's right. great to, it's great to land guys and get a late steal. And I know you think that Vega Ione, uh, hopefully I got that right this time, is uh, really one of the better pools uh, that anyone had in the late part of the late signing day. So that was good for Penn State. But as we've talked about. You need to see it on the field. I mean, we can sit here and talk about stars and potential and impact and blah, blah, blah until we're blue in the face. But I think most Penn State fans at this point want to see it in action. They want to see it happen. Yep. And so I think that's where we're at at this point with that. And I think you can see obvious, clear things uh, and reasons for hope, but you need to see it on the field first is where I'm at. Yeah, yeah, and I, that's that's an entirely fair point to make because the the development of the players that were currently on the roster from Phil Troutwine has not happened just yet. I think we're going to start to see that this upcoming season with some of the young guys that are going to be inserted in the lineup, but it's it did get off to a rough start, so there's some ground to make up there. The class of 23. Uh, James Franklin made some comments during the uh, his sign- National Signing Day press conference about the strength of Pennsylvania and the class of 2022, and that's why it landed where it did. Fortunate to have that. Mentioned that 23 is not as strong in Pennsylvania, or at least that's what I've been getting from you and from Ryan Snyder. What's your view on the class of 2023 when you expand from that to the regional area where Penn State has also been successful over the last couple of seasons? Yeah, so, I mean, all the pieces are there, right? I mean, at this point, you have uh, Joey Schlaffer, Lamont Payne, and Jevin Williams committed to Penn State uh, in in the state of Pennsylvania. You have two targets that are really – they're really high on in Rodney Gallagher and Tamir Robinson. You know, Pill Pixiotti is a guy we talked about a lot. Austin Ramsey, Josiah Trotter. I mean, there's plenty of talent here, and that's not even getting into who could be next up at Lackawanna College, which I know Ryan Snyder wrote about at BWI in his mailbag last week. So you have that, and then the, the Mid-Atlantic region is good too. I mean, if you look at this story over at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com, I mean, they already have pretty much the two best players in Virginia in Alex Birchmeyer and Matthias Barnwell committed. Yeah. Josh Miller and Anthony Yonka are as well. Four-star linebacker Tony Rojas is a guy that – Ryan Snyder really thinks can it will end up at Penn State eventually, so he's a name to watch. You know, they just had Jason Moore, who's a top 50 player from Maryland on campus. Chase Basantis is a tremendous offensive lineman uh, from the state of uh, New Jersey. And then you have Samson Okanola, if I can say that today, uh, from Massachusetts. And you have some guys down in Washington, D.C. as well, led by Nick Harbour, who's a five-star and can pick the school he wants to go to. So, you know, again, is it going to align quite like it did in terms of the same numbers uh, in this cycle? It might. I don't think there's quite that many. But uh, do I think Penn State will be in the ballpark and have highly rated guys from both? And will the stars align in that sense? Yeah, I think they will. Yeah, and it's not like Penn State has – I hate to say this again. It's not – I hate to always bring up these tropes, but it's not like Penn State has thoroughly dominated the state where N.I. White in the last cycle uh, left uh, the state to go elsewhere, and there's been 
numerous examples of those high-end talents coming uh, going national when their recruiting gets that big. Penn State was able to win some of those last uh, cycle. But in general, do you see a difference between the success rate in Pennsylvania versus the region, the uh, the DMV region as it is? And if so, which one do you think they're more successful in? Well, I think it changes by year, right? I mean, I think mm-hmm. I look. I understand what uh, James Franklin was doing when he came in here and said dominate the state and blah blah blah. But ultimately, it's tough to make. You know, it, it yeah. sounds great. It's a coaching cliche, right? Go to a new place. You know, I'm sure Brent Pry. If I went back and listened to his news conference when he got to Virginia Tech, he probably had some quote about putting a fence around the state of Virginia or yeah. something like you know something along those lines. And Penn State is currently just picking, and he's actually <laughs> helped them to some degree. I mean, yeah. just pick whatever they want down there so you know it sounds great but it's hard to do it's hard to do in this day and age the pandemic and all the electronic communication changed what kids have access to what they could see and hear and learn about so you know to me i just think that yeah in they're usually pretty darn good in pa but they don't always get the highest rated kid you mentioned an i white uh Julian Fleming, obviously, is a name that Penn State fans know well. There's been some others. Uh, So they do volume recruiting well in PA. Not always the best guy. Now, of course, Micah Parsons and some others are examples of the contrary. But yeah, yeah. 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 And then in the region, I think that, you know, New Jersey has talent, but it's been a little bit down. But Penn State's really done well in Maryland over the last few years. Is it the volume part? Is that what we're is that what we should focus on as as opposed to the quality of the talent and and the the where it is in the state, I also think matters. Philadelphia is very different than the rest of the state. So is, is that the comment meaning the volume of talent and the depth of talent where you can miss on a couple of guys because you're going to, right. uh, and then you can still get really quality players that lean Penn State because they grew up as Penn State fans or they're in the region and it's it's just an easier sell. Yeah, I think for a lot of these guys in Pennsylvania, it's just an easier sell, T. Frank. Yeah. I think that... When you, especially, in, you know, they've done so well in Pittsburgh, they're getting better in Philly. But again, with the Philly guys, there's a lot of them, T. Frank, that have gone to or have seen teammates go to different schools, whether it's the SEC or Texas or what have you. So they can vision a little bit easier, I think, the idea of not necessarily having to stay home to go to school, to be able to leave Pennsylvania and have success away from home. So that's what you fight down there. But Pittsburgh certainly seems to be a lot better place for Penn State recruiting-wise. I don't know why that is, but it certainly seems to be the case, at least right now. We'll see. Terry Smith has been doing a tremendous amount of work to change that in Philadelphia. Yeah, and by the way, and it's just an easy shortcut to say, but th- that particular dominate the state comment is going into fourth grade. So... Uh, you know, to, br- to right. bring to bring something like a, th- my problem with it is to bring something like that up from nine years ago just seems a little bit um, like you're doing it on purpose. But it, I mean, the turn of phrase worked, so that's why we are where we are. Any other last thoughts about the class of 2023 uh, and the talent that Penn State has lined up and what you've seen from them, the players that are interested in Penn State? Well, you know, again, I think that they are doing a good job right now of recruiting their base with the idea of trying to get some guys from Florida or Texas or some other Alabama, you know, some other places um, that they don't, they're not going to usually get a ton of guys from, but a couple a year is never a bad thing. Right. So I think they're doing a good job of getting the guys who are ready to commit on board and still doing a lot of great work when it comes to trying to get guys uh, moving forward in this class. It, it, It currently sits inside the top five. So, so far, so good in my mind, I think they're recruiting, uh, approach rather is really good and it's giving off some good early vibes i think the prospects their families and of course penn state as well and the last question about this is penn state was seventh i think finally when it all the dust all settled on 22 they're in the top five right now very early on um is this i i guess the 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 question i have is is that when it comes to the on-field performance i think a lot of fans think that's a huge factor so how is Penn State be able to do this with two seasons that are substandard for where the classes are ranked currently? Yeah, you know, again, we were just talking about this over in the Lions Den forum. Uh, somebody had responded to the article you were talking about with a comment about, well, you know, how the team does on the field will have a big impact in which of these guys Penn State can land. And, I, you know, you can say that, yeah, but look at what they're doing at, to your point, look at what they're doing after a 7-6 and six season that started 5-0 and oh and end it pretty horribly. I mean, yeah. It doesn't feel like they're coming off that season. So it's a credit to the message of the staff. It's credit to the players who are currently there trying to make things better. But, you know, guys, 
you know, current success matters, of course. Everybody wants to play for a college football playoff or a Big Ten title or what have you. But the other thing is, is when there's struggles and whatnot, it can showcase a way for a guy to maybe get on the field sooner than he's expecting to in another place. And so that can be a good selling point too, even though it comes on the heels of maybe not a good season or not a fun season or something like that. So, and this is the last, last, last question, and I'll just start by making a comment here. This is how Penn State recruits, though. So they're in the top five right now. They get out to a hot start. James Franklin and his staff, they're always forward-looking. They always seem to land one or two commitments in the class of tw- the, the class ahead of the one they're working on. Going into the class of 2024, Phil Troutwine already has an offensive lineman uh, committed to that class. So this tends to be the case if they build an early lead and then they maintain it and then the five-star schools end up getting those players and they leapfrog right. Penn State. So is this... I don't think I don't think the class of 22 is the aiming point from what I've heard from Ryan Snyder and from you. And it, but where do you think is a reasonable spot for this class to land based on the available talent interested in the Nittany Lions at this point? And I know I'm asking you to project way in the future, but a ballpark of where they might be. Well, I think the biggest question right now is you look at the commit list and obviously part of them being where they're ranked has to do with the number of guys that are committed, but not all of it, of course. Obviously, uh, you know, when you look at this Penn State class and you talk about where the rankings are going to go, uh, does Alex Birchmeyer earn a five star, the fifth star rather? You right. know, uh, when I screw on the list here, is Joey Schlaffer, Lamont Payne, or Josh Miller, or Anthony Donka, do they get four star billing at yeah. some point? Because again, I think the obvious one is is Mega Barnwell. That is going right. to go up some way, form or fashion. If he's not right. an athlete or if he's at a position, his talent, from what I've seen, is is four very high four star. So that right. would be one I would look at too. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, it's just a matter of how those things shake out, right? And does Penn State land then more three stars or four stars or five stars as we move forward? I mean, to me, I look at their talent list, and there's a lot of four stars out there, but I think it's fair to expect Penn State to be around the top 10 of the on three consensus team rankings each and every year. Maybe just maybe 11-12, maybe 8-7, something like that, 9, but... I think it's fair to expect them to be in that ballpark, and this early start has given them the opportunity to be. A couple of struggles a couple years ago, Penn State seems to be making up for that now in recruiting, and as we know, that is how this all works. That's how you get the success on the football field is by having a lot of really good football players. And we have a really good staff here at Blue White Illustrated, which is why the BWI Daily Edition is so strong every single day, especially on Mondays with Greg Pickle. Greg, thanks for coming on the show. Always a pleasure, T. Frank. Have a great week, everyone. Make sure you subscribe to Blue Eyed Illustrated on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We'll talk to you tomorrow.